your mercy never fails me all my days have been held in your hands from the moment that i wake up until i lay my head oh, i will sing the goodness Oh my God. 
more time. That was amazing. That was amazing. Listen, good evening, Calvary Life. How's everyone doing tonight? All right, all right. I want you to look at somebody next to you. Look at someone next to you. Say, I'm glad you made it. All right, look at someone else next to you. Somebody else say, I'm glad you made it. That's right. We are so glad that you are here tonight. My name is Steve Mayo. I am a pastor and one of your missionaries at Providence Church Coatesville, which is just outside of Philadelphia. And it is truly an honor to be here with you for our Go Impact 2024. Can we make some noise one more time? I know y'all are ready. I know y'all are ready. Now listen, we're going to start in a way that you might not be used to. I don't know if Pastor Chet ever started this way, but it's Go Impact, right? So we got to start a little bit different. So I want to see if you can just follow me and we'll just, we'll start it off like this. See, everybody brace for impact. In fact, his ordained church is intact. In fact, most of mankind, they've been trapped and hijacked. So we stack kingdom concepts within rap. See, I just read the scripture so I see the paradox. The one who has everything met with the have-nots. Sin is in shady dudes you find on those back blocks, but salvation is a free gift, so we hit the jackpot. Amen. Amen. See, life can feel uphill like we on a grace climb. Got to stay connected like we on a FaceTime. But we can't waste time. So preach the gospel and tell them hell is hot like LeBron on the baseline. See, out in a foreign country or here in the drive through If you chilling at in and out they need the Lord too. See, whether you the businessman, mom or the janitor posted in South America, Lebanon or Canada, look. He's chief on the throne. He's chief in my home. Matter of fact, I think he makes a better chief than Mahomes. And when our time is up and the trumpet is blown, that's when indebted Christ pop up first like flip phones. Look, everybody's called, so we up on deck. That's whether you're taking a trip or sending a check. And even if you're old like a CD fam, if you fall, just know he'll catch you like CD lamb. See? He predestined your ways and asked before you were formed. Then you accepted the Lord and your aura was born. He's the Lord of my mic. He reigns in all rap forms. Let's go and tell him Jesus is king on all platforms. Make some noise for Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I'm so excited to be with you. If you have your Bibles, you can get them out. Again, my name is Steve Mayo, and coming all the way from just outside of Pennsylvania, I serve, again, as one of your missionaries as a critical response pastor in the city of Coatesville. Coatesville is about 30 minutes west of Philadelphia, and we do urban missions. We do missions in the prison, uh, really frontline missions. When you think of uh, urban context is uh, what we're involved in, and it's good to be here. And I have to report, listen, I was here in April. This is my second time back. I already feel like family. I don't feel like a visitor anymore. So I guess kudos to you guys. I feel very, very welcome and so good to be here. Um, my family was not able to make it. Uh, my wife, Morgan, we've been married for 21 years. And I know she'll be happy that I got that number right. Uh, She's my better half for sure. And then we have three boys. Uh, so, you know, three boys, two of them, two of my boys are teenagers. So you probably heard that and you're like, we got to pray for this brother um, for sure. And my youngest son is a Lakers fan. So he's really mad that he couldn't come, but he has school. But uh, I'm excited to be here. Our house is crazy. It's a lot of fun, but it's good to be with you in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. That's where we'll be tonight. We're going to dive right into the word. Matthew 5 will be in John 17, Philippians 3. But Matthew 5 is our main text for tonight. We're looking at the idea of impact, right? And a faith that will not be hidden. The idea of impact with a faith that cannot be hidden. I love this idea of impact. When you think about impact, you think of things like a noticeable or strong effect. When you think about the idea of impact, you have the idea of something that's influenced significantly. Impact also means to strike deeply with a noticeable imprint, to make 
an impact. See, there's so many examples in God's word in the Bible. We can look in Genesis. We can look in Hebrews of those who made a great impact because of their great faith in Jesus Christ. And hopefully this week we ask the question, church, what does this mean for my life? See, Calvary Life, there will be a corporate challenge for this church But let me see everyone's eyes for a second. There's going to be something specific that God speaks to just you. And if we have ears to hear, we'll hear exactly what he is saying to just us. There's a corporate call, but there's also a personal call tonight that I hope you're listening for. Maybe it's tonight. Maybe it's this week. Maybe it's next week. But as we stay in tune with him, there's something God wants to speak through this impact. Go impact 2024 to just you, no matter how young or old. No matter how seasoned or unseasoned, no matter where you find yourself in life tonight, I would say this present day reveals a lot of hopelessness, right? There's a lot of people who are looking for hope, and that's exactly why we are called, hopefully as a church, as people who go out to bring true hope, to bring real hope. See, Scripture even implores us to do this. We think about some great scripture references. I think about Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the great commission. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded. Even in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, it calls us ambassadors. It says, making an appeal so that you would be reconciled to Christ. And as we read God's word tonight, we think of those passages and those faithful people who went before us, but also it's helpful to notice where God has placed us and what it looks like to have a faith that is noticed, what it looks like to have a faith that is not hidden, a faith not just of words, but one of action, or I would say it like this, a faith that makes an impact. So before we dive into Matthew 5, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. We want to invite him tonight. And uh, God, we're thankful because this is your church. Lord, there's nothing special about us except for in the way that you created us, how you love us. And God, you allow us to be used of you. We're so thankful for that. Lord, I'm thankful for Calvary Life. I'm thankful for what is happening here on behalf of you. And God, I pray as we dive into the scriptures tonight. It's not my words. Lord, it's your word that's powerful. It's your word that makes things come alive. It's your word that changes lives. And so, God, be with this church. And, Lord, be with us as we get into your word tonight. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. 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 Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 10. We will go all the way through 16. And we're starting in verse 10. And we're kicking it off, and and I want to just kind of say as we begin, this is all the words of Jesus. If you're not familiar with this particular passage, this is known as the Sermon on the Mount, the longest section of red. If you have one of those Bibles where Jesus' words are in red, uh, the longest section of continuous red in your Bible. And Jesus has been teaching the multitudes. You see it in verses 1 and 2. We won't go there, but he's been teaching the multitudes. The disciples are there also. And he's starting in such a radical way with things that... They've never heard before. It's radically refreshing is how I would put it. And he gets it started with the Beatitudes, things so different to what they were used to hearing from the religious leaders of that day that the people find it, I'm sure, radical, but also refreshing as Jesus teaches. He says things like, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, those who desperately need Jesus, blessed are the meek. Those who have power under control, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, right? For they shall be filled. And he's going through the Beatitudes and he gets to verse 10. But all the while he's setting a tone, he's almost setting a new attitude different from anything that they've heard before, especially from the religious leaders and teaching them this day. So follow with me, Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. And it says this. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in this same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we get this idea of blessed are you, and it's like, who is blessed? Well, blessed are those who are persecuted for Christ. Blessed are those who are insulted In Christ's name, blessed are those who are living a transformed life and have a faith that is not hidden. I would almost put it, blessed are those who have an active faith, right? 
See, sometimes we forget it's a privilege as believers to share the gospel with others. It is our privilege as believers to share the gospel with others. And if this is happening to you, before we get upset, before we get mad, we have to remember that this will come if we desire to make an impact. See, when we're clearly not on board with the world system, hostility is for sure going to come our way. And I'm not sure how many of you have faced hostility in your life lately, especially if you're living for Jesus or vocally proclaiming Jesus where you are. But I recently spoke at a youth conference just north of San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, and I was speaking there, and a girl came up to me after the message, and she said, you know, in my high school, as a young girl, about 16, 17, in my high school, we get it all the time. I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, as soon as people find out we're Christian from social media, from our teachers, from our friends, and this is a high school which is very hostile to the gospel. She said, as a matter of fact, I have my Bible on my desk and my teacher saw my Bible and he went and got a book off of his desk and he walked by and he put it on my, on, right on top of her Bible. And I said, what was the book? And she said, it was a book by Richard Dawkins called The God Delusion. See, blessed when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. See, we're blessed when we deal with evil and persecution falsely leveled against us. And persecution doesn't feel great, right? At the time, persecution does not feel great. But listen, in AD 33, shortly after Jesus ascended, there were 500 followers of Jesus Christ. And then the church went through a time of intense persecution for a couple hundred years. And 300 years later, in 350 AD, there were 31 million followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. See, but blessed, okay? blessed are you. See, what it doesn't say, though, as we read this, and I always have to say this, is it doesn't say blessed are you for being weird. <laughs> now, you might be like, Pastor, you know, what are you talking about? Well, I was reading another story not long ago of an evangelism team in San Diego, And this team of people decided that it would be a good idea for them to go down to the beachfront area and take off their clothes and put mustard all over their bodies and go around yelling at people saying, you just need to have faith as a mustard seed and you, you know, you'll come to life in Jesus Christ. True story. So they did this for about 20 minutes and you can probably guess what happened to them, right? Hey, they got arrested. Hey, Uh, I think I heard someone over here say amen. And. And as they were being carted off, uh, and I think this was maybe even at later on, once they were arrested, they interviewed one of the ladies and she said, we're being persecuted for righteousness sake. And I said, no, you're being arrested because you were being weird. Okay? God, didn't, God didn't call us to do that. But it does remind us, look at verse 12, it says rejoice. I just put this out there that I'm still, that's not an easy one for me. It says, be exceeding glad. I'll put this out there that um, I often struggle with this one as well. Sometimes I feel like a seventh year senior and like rejoicing 101. But it says, rejoice and be exceeding glad because great is your reward in heaven. See, Jesus is setting a new mindset. He's setting a new attitude. And he's reminding us, listen, your faith will rub against the grain of the world. Your faith will rub against the grain of what is traditional religion, but it's when you put your faith into action, everyone's not going to be good with that. As a matter of fact, in 2 Timothy 3.12, I'll read it for you. It says this. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. See, I will put it like this. An active faith will face opposition. An active faith will face opposition. And I don't mean when I talk about opposition and I talk about persecution, there's a difference between the time where you wanted to talk to someone and they just didn't want to hear you or they weren't ready to listen in like true persecution. I give you a quick example. I said I have three teenage or three sons, two of them are teenagers. And the ones who are teenagers often let me know when I don't make the cut. OK. Um, and if it sounds bad, it's, it's as bad as it sounds. So. They, they very frequently let me know. Uh, a few weeks ago, I told you I was in San Francisco. I took my middle son with me on this trip, so he was there with me. And we were walking along one day, and he said, you know, Dad, your outfits just aren't giving off any real aura. <laughs> now, I wanted to look at him. I, was, I looked, I said, wait, what? He said, they're not giving off any aura. I guess aura is the new thing. I didn't know this. I was still back on swag, so I'm behind. Uh, <laughs> I still have baggy clothes from like the 2000s that I hope will come back in style sometime. So 
I'm really behind. I said, yeah, you know, Dad, you're just kind of mid right now. So I'm like, okay, this is great. Like, I'm a mid dad. This is going really good. And he said, you really need to get your gear up. <laughs> and what I wanted to say to him was, do you want to go to college? <laughs> because if you don't, I could look really great by next week. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> you know. But you're going to have those times when you try to share the gospel and you don't connect. You're going to have those times where the people just aren't ready to hear. But I just want to say, like, that's not persecution. See, a Christian rapper named Dayton was recently at our church, um, Providence Church, Coatesville. And he was talking about uh, his friend who was recently trying to share his faith at work. And he was sharing his faith at work and he was talking to people and he was told if he keeps it up, uh, he was going to be let go. And so he actually stopped, but he put Bible verses and sticky notes on his computer and in his cubicle. And unfortunately, two weeks later, he got fired. And he's in the middle of that whole thing. But that's what this is talking about. See, there is real persecution that will come our way when we're out front, when we're trying to make an impact for Jesus Christ. Reading a book, S.M. Houghton says it like this. It's a book called Sketches from Church History, and it talks about the martyrs and some of those really, really tough times. And they're going through some really tough times. Some of them were, you know, put in uh, arenas where they were ripped to shreds. Some of them were burned at the stake. I mean, there were amazing things. And when you hear their responses, some of them, when they would find out their fate, hey, this is what's going to happen to you later today or this afternoon. A lot of times their responses were, well, the gospel's going out. Praise be to God. See, that is what it means to be blessed. In many ways, persecution is a token of an act of faith. Philippians 1.29 puts it like this. For to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. One of my favorite verses, Philippians 3.10, says it like this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Now, as soon as we hear that part, everybody's on board, right? Hey, resurrection power. Amen. Let's go. But there's more to that verse. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed unto his death. And Jesus is reminding us, hey, listen, don't take it personal because it's not about you. It's about me. He says, great is your reward in heaven first. He's setting a kingdom mindset, but he's also saying, watch the impact you will have in the world, even if you're persecuted when you live for me. See, I will put it like this. An active faith is a faith that's making an impact. An act of faith is a faith that's making an impact. See, people see you day in and day out, and they see how you live, and they see how you interact with people, and they may say, you know, girl, if she said that to me, I would have cursed her out, right? Or, man, if he would have did that to me, I would have knocked him out. Or, man, why didn't you take that money? It was right there. No one would have known. But they see the difference in you. They see the difference in how you dealt with that situation. They see the difference in how you dealt with your neighbor or how you dealt with your coworker, or how you're going through a time where maybe you're suffering an illness or someone close to you is, but your faith hasn't been quenched. So you still have faith in God. And they look at you and say, man, how can you do that? How can you go through that? There's something different about you. And you say, you know what? There is something different about me, but it doesn't have anything to do with me. Let me introduce you to the one that helps sustain me. And his name is Jesus Christ. So blessed. See, Jesus is setting an attitude. But I would also say an act of faith is a visible faith. Keep reading with me. Verse 13. Follow along. It says, you are the salt of the earth. Everybody say salt. salt. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. See, I love this because Jesus doesn't say, hey, uh, maybe you're salt or you might be salt. He says, you are salt. And I love it because Jesus is all, almost using something absurd to make his point. See, salt is salt, right? It can't be anything but salt. If it ceases not to do the job, then it is no longer salt. It can't change. It can't lose its saltiness or it's not salt. See, if you look at Luke 14 and 34 and 35, you don't have to turn there, but it says this. Therefore, salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or the manure pile. So it is thrown out. The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. See, Jesus is saying, listen, either you're living as a citizen of heaven 
or you're living in a way that's just existing. Either you're affecting change in an area or you might be living in a way that's just existing. Which one are you going to be? See, our family for a long time lived in Fort Lauderdale. We're back in the Philadelphia area, like I said, and I'm in Fort Lauderdale, and I imagine here in L.A. you don't have to do too much snow shoveling, right? (laughs) Well, we faced the reality of shoveling snow again this past winter, and um, as I was shoveling snow, a friend of mine who's a pastor, this is always my favorite part, our houses are so close that he can look out his window and see me shoveling. And so when I would be shoveling snow again after the first time for like almost 15 years, he would actually take a picture of me and then text it to me from his phone and say, welcome to the neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> but here's the thing about salt. See, when you throw salt down, if you've ever done this, it starts to work immediately. As soon as you put it on snow or ice, there's an immediate effect. I love that Jesus uses something simple that we all know because it is visible. See, one pastor put it this way. I love it. He said, so if you're claiming Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, can you pass the taste test? Can you pass the taste test? See, where we minister, and I know it's probably the same here in Los Angeles, there's addiction Where we minister, there's crime, there's broken families, there's fatherlessness, there's an epidemic of incarceration in our area, it seems, you name it, and we need to be salt, like Jesus said. So I'm going to give you an example. Let me tell you what salt looks like in our prison ministry just outside of Philadelphia. See, salt looks like a volunteer named Jim. And Jim is somewhere between 65 and 70. And Jim faithfully decides with his time that he's going to take and come into Work Release Center. And he does a Bible study every Monday night. And Jim never misses. He never misses. He would never want to miss. And Jim could do all kinds of other things because he's very wealthy. He would never tell you that. But he could just play golf every day and hang out and have leisure time. But he decides it's worth his time to make an impact And he's going to come into work release and do a Bible study. And the men love him and faithfully. So much so that he almost tried to come in on his anniversary. And the guys told him, Jim, no. We want you to keep coming. We don't want your wife upset. So you can skip this week and come back next week. See, to me, that's what salt looks like. It looks like something visible. There's a lot of Christianity that's heard today. There's a lot of Christianity that's blabbed about. But not as much as nearly seen or put into action. See, I like to say it like this. Salt creates a thirst. Salt creates a thirst. I don't know if anyone in here loves to go to the movies. We have any moviegoers in here? Um, I love to go to the movies. Um, my, I, I didn't get there this summer. I wanted to go. My kids saw Despicable Me 4 without me. But when I go to the movies, I love the movies. But what I love even more is um, that movie theater popcorn with the movie theater butter, right? Anybody with me? Now, no matter what I try to do at home with my microwave popcorn, it does not work. And I think, uh, this is just me, maybe, one of the greatest inventions of the 21st century was the fact that they took the butter machine, like, from behind the counter out to the other side, so we can just get it. If you ever see me at the movies, I'm just going to be like this with my popcorn, like, the butter just going into the thing. Uh, And, but here's what happens. You start to eat that popcorn, and what happens? Five minutes, ten minutes. As soon as you start to eat that, you become really what? You are thirsty. You are so thirsty. All of a sudden, you're like, give me something to drink. Like, I need something to drink. This salt, hey, in this butter is taking effect. Give me something to drink now. And that's how to get you with like a $25 soda. But (laughs) it takes effect. It makes a difference almost immediately. But what I think about is when Jesus encountered the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And after a conversation with her, she was so affected that she ran back to tell her village. She said, let me come see a man who told me everything that I ever did. And she brought her whole her whole village back. That's that's the effect. Because Jesus created in her a thirst. Even in that conversation, he says, hey, if you drink this water, you'll never be thirsty again. Right. That's what we need to be taking out and delivering to people. So it begs a question for each one of us. Even personally, who is God asking you to spend time with? I would even say, or where is God asking you to go so that you can create in them a spiritual thirst? Who is God asking you to spend time with so that you can create in them a spiritual thirst? 
If you look at verse 14, it says this. Follow with me. You are the light. Everybody say light. light. Of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. See, we're talking about salt and we're talking about light. And we should be reminded that salt and light are seen and not heard. Now, if you're a parent like me, you're probably like, man, we really got to teach our kids to be salt and light because I want them to be seen and not heard. But (laughs) if you think about that idea of, of salt and light, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. He's saying, how can you live in a way that points people to me? How can your life be a living light? So wherever you go into the darkness, there's a lot of darkness out here that points people to Jesus. And listen, as Jesus is teaching, Jesus is teaching in Capernaum um, right off the Sea of Galilee on one of the hills. And he's up. It even talks about that in the text. He went up to teach and he's talking. And as he's teaching and talking about this idea of a city set on a hill, A lot of scholars say uh, there's probably a city that he was referring to. See, uh, one of the highest elevated cities is a city called Safed. And Safed, uh, and I don't know if you can see it here because it's a little tough to see on this picture, but um, it's kind of right on the top in the distance. And you can see uh, Safed was always lit up, especially at night. And here's the thing. Think about the sailors and the fishermen that Jesus had, especially in his close group, Peter. James and John, hey, these were fishermen, often on the Sea of Galilee. And Safa was a city that not only was up and not only was elevated and lit, but it was on the northern end. So a lot of scholars say, you know what, Jesus was probably talking about this city, a city set on a hill that was a light, because when it's cloudy at night and you're out on the Sea of Galilee and you can't get your direction from the sun and you can't get your direction from the moon, especially if it's cloudy, where are you going to get your direction from? And just underneath the clouds, sitting right on this hill, was Safed that was lit. And it was on the northern end. So it was always something that they could use to, in a sense, get their bearings. But I think about it like this. If that was a city on a hill that was set in a way that it lit up, And those who were on the Sea of Galilee could get their bearings. Are we living in a way, are we instilling around those in us a way that they look at us and they look at our light and they say, man, we can get our bearings from how you live. Can people get our bearings or get their bearings from us because we're living in a way that promotes Jesus Christ more than anything? See, Jesus is the one who never changes. Jesus is the one who we always can look to. When the storms, when the clouds of life roll in, right? See, how can we live in a way that reflects Jesus' light? It could be your neighbor. It could be your coworker. It could be someone that God's been pressing in on your heart to talk to. It could be that young person that's driving you crazy. Trust me, I got three in my home. But who is that person that Jesus is calling to say, hey, the way you live, I want you to live in this way so people can see you and they can get their bearings from me, the one who never changes. Amen. See, talking about where I was at um, in this summer camp youth conference that I took my son to, uh, a couple years before that, I actually took my whole family out. And it's a great place just north of San Francisco called Mount Gilead Bible Camp. And I always go there and I preach um, for, you know, a youth conference in the summertime. And when I'm there, uh, a lot of times it's just me or just me and one of my sons. But I took my whole family and there, we were there for two weeks. And so if you're there for two weeks, you got to do laundry. And my wife is a champion. Um, She did laundry almost the whole time, except for one night when she had done the laundry, but there was still some to get. And the laundry was located in a very far part of the campus. Okay, this is like hundreds of acres. And so she just talked to me and she said, honey, you know, can you go up and get the laundry? It's done. You just got to go get it. So me trying to be a good husband, I was like, sure, honey. And I grabbed the basket. and I said, hey, do you think I need a flashlight? And she said, no, I think you'll be all right. I don't think you need a flashlight. So I said, right. And you, got, you, you already know. So I grabbed the basket and I start walking and I'm walking up this hill. And she had told me, no, there's lights on the way. There's poles. And I had actually been to this section of the campground before when it was daytime. So I'm walking and it's twilight, it's starting to get dark. And the first pole post that had a light was supposed to be on it. Guess what? The light was out. 
So already I'm in trouble. So I keep making this trek up this hill and I'm making my way up the hill and I'm looking and I'm like, oh man, uh, everything is just really starting to get, I mean, really, really dark. And so all of a sudden I'm walking, I'm starting to hear noises and twigs cracking in the background. Okay? And when you're walking in the dark and there's really no light, you know, this is not like nighttime in LA or nighttime in Philly. This is like no lights at all. Uh, so you're just not as bold as you normally would be. And so I'm walking in. And, and also, by the way, I'm just going to keep it all the way real with you guys. Listen, if you ever seen horror movies, the black people die in like the first five minutes of all of them. Of, I don't know why we just, we take it out quick. So I'm walking up this hill with this laundry basket. And I'm thinking like, well, I had a good life. Huh? You know, this is the end. Uh, and it is pitch dark. And all of a sudden, as I'm walking up, uh, one of the counselors, I didn't even see her. All of a sudden, she just turned on one of those big handheld lights. And it was like, it's almost like a big spotlight. And it took me by surprise. And all of a sudden, you know, I knew exactly where I was. I got my bearing, so to speak. And the first thing she said was, where's your light? <laughs> Great question. And I noticed that I was walking one way and I was kind of heading where I was going, but it, it was a paved path, but I was actually heading the wrong way. Because they didn't have my light. See, Jesus is calling us to be lights. Wherever you are, whatever your context is, whatever your station is, wherever you are, Jesus is saying, hey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be a light. See, Luke 8, 16, no one lights a lamp and hides it under a clay jar. Jesus said he's the light of the world, but we're also lights when we reflect his light. And you think about spiritual light and think, why? Well, because the darkness people face is real. And I was thinking about this because even when I got here last night, I had a chance to just drive around. I was driving around some of the parks and just some of the areas and just 15 minutes around Calvary Life. And I saw people at parks and I saw people on sports teams and just said, man, all these people, who is going to share Jesus Christ with these people? Has to be us. Has to be his church. So what does light look like in Gardenia or South Bay or Compton? See, to me, light looks like a group of young people who say, hey, instead of just hanging out again, the next time we have our Bible study, the next time we post up at In-N-Out, maybe we'll see if there's people our age and maybe we'll ask them to come over and join our Bible study. You know, maybe we'll go out and witness to them and, and say, hey, you know what, would you, you know, you, you know about Jesus? You know, would you, would you come to church? Because you never know what God's going to do until you step out in faith. Amen? Amen. See, a lot of people tell me all the time, they say, man, I'm bored with the Christian life. I'm bored. And sometimes young people, I'm sorry, but it's young people. And they say, man, I'm so bored with the Christian life. And I say a lot of times it's because you're a spectator and not a participant, right? See, if we're bored with the Christian life, you're probably a spectator and not a participant. I tell people, man, are you really bored? Here's what I want you to do. Go out and witness to 15 people tomorrow and come back and tell me how it went. Because I'll tell you one thing. It will not be boring. <laughs> it will not be boring. Okay. Someone might ask you to pray for them. Someone might give you a hug. Unfortunately, someone might curse you out. I don't know what's going to happen. But. God calls us to spread his word. See, it reminds me of Isaiah 60, 1 through 3. And in the beginning of that verse, Isaiah 61, it says, arise and shine. Hey, okay? arise and shine. You know, even when I was young, my mom used to come to my room and she used to sing, you know, rise and shine and give God the glory. Hey, you all know it. See, you guys are good. Except for even when I was like still 16 and 17, she would still come in and sing it. And I was like, I'm good, mom. I'm a teenager now. We're good. Sometimes I used to not like it, but now I love it because God is calling us. He's calling the church today. Listen, rise and shine and go and make an impact. And this moment could be the greatest opportunity to get the gospel out in your lifetime. And if we don't go, we might miss it. We might miss it. And people are in real darkness that needs real hope. Listen, we have an election in 60 days. There's gender issues that we're fighting battles you can't believe. There's financial crisis. There's people who are hurting, and they need us to go out and be lights. Let your light shine in a way that it illuminates Jesus Christ. See, the first time I came to a beach near a Caribbean area, uh, when our family moved to a place called Fort Lauderdale, um, we got a chance to go to the Bahamas. 
And as we went to the Bahamas, I had heard about the Bahamas and I heard about this amazing water and I heard about just how clear it was and how amazing this water was. But as much as I had heard, it was nothing like actually being there and experience it for myself. Okay? And I actually thought after that, because I go into places like Ocean City, New Jersey on the East Coast, I realized I was taking my life in my hands because that water is dark and I can't see anything. <laughs> but there was nothing, I heard about it, but it was nothing like experiencing it for myself. But I thought, imagine if we were going to go to a seminar on what the beach was like. Imagine if you went to a room and said, hey, this is what the beach is like. We're going to tell you what the beach is like. We're going to describe it for you. But the next week you come, we're actually going to go. And so imagine the first week you heard about it. But then the second week you came back and you had, you know, your swim trunks and your flippy floppies and everything you needed. And you got there and you were all ready to go. And they said, hey, are you ready to go? And you say, no, no, no. You know what? I don't really want to go to the beach. I just want to hear about it again. Can we go back to that room where you just described the beach again? Because when you described it, it was so nice. It sounded so good. And imagine if week after week after week, you just kept coming back to that room to hear about the beach, but never go. Now That sounds crazy, right? But unfortunately, that's what we do sometimes with church, right? It sounds so great. We're going to go. We're going to go. And then we come back the next week and describe it. And God gives us the opportunity to go out. But... Sometimes we just want to hear about it. And God's saying, listen, no, I want you to go. And I want to encourage everyone in here tonight. When you go, God is calling you to make an impact. He's calling us to make an impact. See, what would God do if you weren't on the sidelines, but you got in the story? What would God do if you weren't a spectator, but you got in the game? What would God do if you were ready to make an impact? See, I always say, You could be remembered for being something amazing. We just had the Olympics. And a matter of fact, I think if I'm right, the Olympics are here next time, right, in L.A.? Yeah. See, we remember those performances. They stand out to us. We remember the things people did. But I always say, hey, those will pass away. Those will fade. As great as those performances are, they don't have any eternal value in a sense, just the performance in itself. But imagine if you could do something not only amazing, but that would last for eternity, right? That would not just be for this life, but would also be for the next life. See, so many people are living for such a short blip on the screen of their life, and it goes in one direction in eternity, and they're not thinking about eternity. They're just thinking about what happens here and now, and a lot of times stuff that's insignificant compared to what God is offering us for eternity. See, God is saying, hey, Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Our tendency is to focus on the here and now. But I think about the faith journey of people who didn't focus on the here and now. I think about people like Enoch who said, hey, you know what? You can do what you want, but I'm going to walk with God. I think about people with a faith journey like Noah who said, I'm going to go against the grain of everything else in the face of lots of ridicule and persecution. It's just going to be me and my family. And I see what God did with him. He put his faith into action. You think about Abraham who left everything he knew. He left his father, he left the comfort, he left his country, and he went out. But you read in Isaiah and it calls Abraham a friend of God. You know, you look what God did through those. But here's the thing, God has a call for us just like he has a call for all those people if we're willing to have an active faith. See, in 1 Peter 4, 10, 12, it says this. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the multifaceted grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do it so as one who is speaking actual words of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength with which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever. Amen you one more story before we close and this one's personal to me I was working as a waiter in a place called Ocean City Maryland and um, I was in college and it was just a summer and it was some buddies of ours and we were Christian and uh, we weren't living in a way that wasn't honoring God but I was working as a waiter at a place for about a month and a half and then someone else came and in two weeks I watched him share his faith with person after person after person but I was a Christian And again, I wasn't living contrary to God, but I sure wasn't being active. And so after a couple weeks, I came up to him and I said, hey, man, I noticed that you're sharing your faith. That's awesome. And you're really, you know, again, for lack of a better term, you're making an impact in where you are. And we just talked. 
And I said, I'm a Christian too. And I'll never forget what he said. He looked at me and he said, you are? I said, yeah. He said, okay. He said, I didn't know. I never forget that. And that stung a little bit. And as I walked away, I thought, man, I never want anyone to say that about me ever again. Sometimes non-examples could be the best example. See, I had a light, but it wasn't on. I had a light, but no one could see it. I had a light, but I wasn't reflecting what Jesus was calling me to do. And I saw someone else who was, and I thought, man, I should have been doing that. See, but if you're here under the sound of my voice tonight, we still have time. Okay? We still have time. I always say it. I go into prison and preach often. I say, listen, if you're breathing, then God has something for you to be achieving. And so while we have time, can we make an impact? See, maybe you're here tonight and you're like, hey, my light has grown dim. Okay? And it's time for that not to happen anymore. Maybe you're here tonight. And you say, hey, Pastor, you know what? I've been one of those people you've been talking about. I've been sitting on the sidelines, and God is calling me to get involved. Maybe you're here tonight, and you say, hey, you know what? God is calling me to go. And I don't even know what that means exactly yet, but I know I need to have the boldness to pray. I need to have the boldness to step into faith to go and do what he's told me to do, whether that's right here in Los Angeles or whether that's halfway across the world. I don't know. But if God has been calling you, don't ignore that call any longer. See, we are the church. And we're the same church in here, but we're the same church out there. Amen? Amen. See, and there aren't a bunch of professional Christians that are coming to rescue us. It's not just on Pastor Dennis and Pastor Chet. Like, God is calling us. And some of you might look around and say, well, Pastor, God is calling us. I don't know. I'm looking around. That's kind of scary. And I might say, you know what, I agree with you, because sometimes I feel like a mess. But even when I feel like a mess, I'm his mess. God continues to use us. He doesn't need us, but he continues to fill us. He continues to use us and he continues to send us out. Go impact. We should make an impact. Amen. So as we close, I want to do something for everyone that's in here. I just want to have a prayer. And um, in a second, we're going to pray, and I'm going to invite the worship team up uh, to just come and close us out. But I want to do something. Um, when we pray, I'm going to ask you to be a little bit bold. And in a second, I'm going to ask you that if God has been laying something on your heart tonight that you need to have boldness to step out, I'm just going to ask you in a second right where you are just to stand because we want to pray for you. See, we're the church, and we have to be a community that encourages and supports each other. And I just want to say, if someone stands around you, would you just either reach a hand out towards them, or maybe if you're close enough, put a hand on them. We say at our church, the church isn't like a family. The church is a family. And if God has been laying something on your heart, say, you know what, Pastor? God has spoke through you tonight. I need to be bold. I pray that you would just take the first step and just to stand and say, you know what? God has been calling me. I know I need to go. I'm not even sure what that looks like yet, but I know I need to step out. And maybe you know, maybe specifically you know exactly why, why God is calling you. You know exactly what you need to do. But before we pray, would you just stand if that's you? See, church, everyone who is standing is, amen. This is just the beginning. You can talk to the missionaries. You can talk to pastors. You can talk to many people who said, you know, standing just like this was the first step to where God totally took me on a journey that I never foresee. But it was, it was better than anything that you could think or imagine, right? God knows the best plan for our life. So for those that are standing in a second when we pray, again, like just reach out a hand, extend it, or if you're close enough, just put a hand on them. We want to pray for boldness for them to step into what God is calling them to do. So would you just reach out right now or put a hand on them and would you bow with me as we pray? God, we're thankful for this church. Lord, we remember more than anything that it's not our church, it's your church. Lord, we remember that you use us in a mighty way, but you don't need us. And so, God, I pray for all those who have just taken the first step. 
which is the faith to stand and say, I'm acknowledging that God is calling me to do something, whether it's their neighbor, whether it's their coworker, whether it's a call to go and minister. Lord, I don't know what it is, but you do. And so God, I pray that you would reveal it. Maybe they know, but Lord, if they don't continue in the next coming days to reveal it for them so they can step truly into the calling that you have for them. Lord, give us boldness. God, I thank you for all those who are standing with arms extended. Lord, for those who are standing with arms wrapped around because we are a family in Christ. So God, again, fill each person who's standing with boldness to preach and boldness to go. And God, help us to be your church. That's what you call us to. And Lord, we know it's greater than anything we could think or imagine. It's greater than any plan we could come up with because it's of you. And so God, Lord, as we close out in prayer, we're thanking you ahead of time because we know what you're gonna do because you're a faithful God. Lord, thank you for each person who's standing. Thank you for this church. And Lord, we pray that one day, You may not get a chance to tell all the stories of what came out of Go Impact 2024, but heaven gives us eternity to talk about it. We know it's gonna be amazing. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your word. And we pray these things in your name, Amen. amen. Church, would you stand with me as we close in worship? Yeah.